This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Welcome to a special episode. Um, at the moment, there is a climate summit in Glasgow called COP26. And I have with me my cousin Michael Kalati, and he's got a lot of information that we need to hear at this time. And I'm going to hand you straight over to Michael, who's going to explain more about this subject. Thank you, Rabbi Shiach. So um, I wanted to talk about um, an issue that we're facing at the moment. In uh, It's an important juncture in uh, humanity's history. Um, there's a, a summit going on uh, in Glasgow, COP26, which our world leaders are gathering to um, formalize... Um, uh, their sort of uh, um, strategy strategy yeah. to how to tackle um, the climate issue. Now, it's been a week. I mean, we're recording this on Sunday, the seventh of uh, of November, mm-hmm. and um, it seems from all the reports that people, the, the leaders, are not taking it as seriously as they should. Mm-hmm. This uh, I've been following, uh, as you may well know from the previous series this climate issue for a number of years and I've seen the various scientists reports that are delivered every five years and they are getting more and more urgent and they uh, have come to a point now where this is, if we're going to act, we have to use the kind of power of now. Uh, We have to act now in order to avert a potential uh, climate crisis in the future that will not not affect us necessarily or as a middle aged generation, peak generation yeah. but we will affect the next generation and definitely the one after that so if you have children it 's very important to take perhaps some uh, you know to have to give this some thought um, serious thought serious yeah. thought so we have been presented with the facts by scientists. Uh, it's akin to a doctor taking your temperature or, or even more seriously taking perhaps a vial of blood from you and coming back with the results and tell, saying, look, your, your, your certain cell counts are high. You've got a major problem. Uh, you probably feel OK now, but you have to take action right now to stop whatever's going to develop in you. Um, you wouldn't turn to your doctor and say, no, that's fake news. Or I don't believe it, or it's not. It's a, it's, a, it's a serious thing, and we have to take action now. It's very important. We um, the conference is spread over two weeks, and it's uh, it it covers two parshas: the Toldos and Vayetze. I want to bring something from Toldos that we just lamed yesterday. Um, the ish, the, uh, the the act of Esau with Jacob when Jacob. Uh, offered, or rather, Esau demanded some of the uh, um, uh, Jacob's right. pottage, mm. um, and said, "I want to have this today. I want to have uh, 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 um, some some of your pottage." Um, he says, "You know, anyway, I'm going to die." He felt faint, and he was going to die. So he says, "I want it now." This is like society is now. We want our pottage. We want to feed ourselves with what we want, and not care about what we're giving up. Uh, he was Jacob asked him to give up his birthright for the pottage, and he did. He gave up his birthright, and he acted in the now, but he acted irresponsibly in the now, like we are doing. Now, we must understand that if we take action, it can only be done in the now. Uh, the, the, the past is a memory, the future is just an illusion, and all that... Uh, has existed or will ever, ever exist is the now. So we must sanctify the now by using the now to act and affect uh, change for not so much ourselves, but for our children and our children's children. You know, we may be gone by the time these these catastrophes affect. Uh, you know, so we have to face facts. I know it sounds a bit harsh, but we have to face these facts. So... We must also analyze what you know. Whose generation is this? If you uh, are, are sitting at home and you have your family around you, your children and your grandchildren, you must ask yourself: Whose generation does this world belong to? 
probably your your gut reaction was to say it's it's my generation. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm in my middle age. I'm uh, affecting things in the world. Uh, is it really your generation? Is this your world? Who does the world belong to? The world belongs to, in my opinion, the newest generation. The world belongs to the new generation. The newest generation is the, are the youngest amongst us. Your grandchild, or at least your child. It is their world. Mm. Now, they are not old enough yet to effect change. So we are uh, the ones that must start the process uh, Rabbi Taufan urges us that it's not our responsibility to finish the work of Tikkun Olam in this case, but we are not free to desist from it either. So we have to face facts and we have to act for our children's sake. So I've spoken in various episodes before, just I don't want to bark on about all the different methods of uh, what you can do, but the principal one, the, the most effective one for uh, any person who's listening to this that wants to know how can I affect climate change uh, effectively is to give up uh, red meat. In fact, it's, if you just give up beef and lamb, that's the majority that you have to do. So uh, that is, if you just if you wanted to know, but this episode I wanted to talk to you about something more than that. It seems from, I've been following the news with this climate uh, summit and it seems like the world leaders are not acting as they should do it's a lot of hot air and if if nothing changes now we don't have another chance so it's simple as that mm. so um, so what do we do uh, it looks like um, all that's left is to ask god to help in this situation and i wanted to bring two uh two two cases in history uh, one Noah and one Avraham, uh, where humanity was threatened with destruction. Uh, and what actually was the difference between the two? So um, we know that uh, Noah was the earliest known case of nature preservation, and he went out of his way to save animals and plants. Uh, but there was only one species that Noah um, didn't make any effort to save, and that was the human population. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, story in uh, the Zohar, Zohar Hashmatot on Genesis 254 Ahmed Base, and it relates the following story. Uh, when Noah left the ark after having seen the world destroyed, uh, he began to cry before Hashem and said, uh, Master of the universe, you are called compassionate. You should have been compassionate for your creation. And Hashem responded and said, You are a foolish shepherd. Now you say this? Why did you not say this at the time I told you that I saw that you were righteous amongst your generation? Or afterwards, when I said I will bring a flood upon the people? Or afterwards, when I said to build an ark? I constantly delayed and I said, When is Noah going to ask for compassion for the world? And now that the world is destroyed, you open your mouth to cry in front of me and to ask for supplication. This is from the Zohar, Hashmatot, Genesis 254b. This is a very interesting thing because you almost feel sorry for Noah because he did so much that, of God, that God asked him. But what God really wanted him to do all along was to plead for humanity. And this is we must take a very, very careful note of this because our thoughts have more power than perhaps we ever realized. We won't know really why Noah didn't uh, fight to revoke this decree and spare the world from destruction. Maybe he thought that the world was so depraved that it wasn't suited for redemption, or that only animals were supposed to survive, or perhaps Noah thought that the essence of his terrible generation would rub off on him and he would be destined also for destruction. So in this sense, Noah essentially was living in his own ark even before the flood and didn't feel a connection or responsibility to the world that was about to be decimated. Um, but we do know that his descendant Avraham, uh, ten generations later, did plead with God to exercise mercy uh, on the people of Sodom. Avraham opened his eyes to the plight of the innocents 
and attempted to intercede on their behalf. So we have to the second story of potential destruction, where now Avraham, who perhaps has somehow uh, has a new um, outlook uh, on on humanity, uh, pleads on behalf of the righteous to save uh, to save the Sodom. But mo- very importantly, we have to note that Hashem initially tells Avraham of his intentions regarding Sodom. So this is very important. If God wanted to destroy any city, he could have done it without mentioning it to Avraham. But he set, he set a table for Avraham to effect uh, a, a kind of supplication or an entreatment for humanity. He gave him every opportunity. He said, this is what I'm going to do. So thank God, immediately Avraham uh, intercedes on behalf of humanity as opposed to Noah. So we must take note of this, that it's our duty, and God wants us, as we learned before in Zohar, God wants us to stop him from these actions. And he encourages Avraham by not interrupting his series of increasing demands. We learned that he, he said, look, if you, would you save uh, Saddam for 50 righteous people? And he says, yes, I would save Saddam for 50 righteous people. He goes, well, for 45, would you? <laughs> yes, I'll do it for 45. He went all the way down to 10. And I, I imagine that, first of all, <clears throat> uh, the Avraham was actually conceding to God himself for the weakness of man. By saying, look, I know you've let them off, but you know what? I'm going to find it hard to find 50. Mm. Can I find 45? And then all the way down, almost conceding, look, we are human. And this is the, 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 the fallibility of humans. Of humans. Yeah. yeah. So, but I also, also since I was a child learning this, I always imagined in my mind that Hashem was very pleased and almost smiling at Avraham's kind of chutzpah yeah. to but haggle for humanity mm. and i always imagined that god was pleased that he did that he have, that he he did this bargaining on behalf of humanity so we must take note of that it's very important so what do we learn from the second approach of avraham who uh, who did this all in his mind we must remember mm. this was all in his mind it was all a communication through through his mind so we have to highlight three actions that uh, the power of prayer, number one, I wonder if the inhabitants of Saddam knew that they were saved by one man's meditation and, and communication with God. Maybe perhaps not, not a word, an, an audible word was uttered, but a whole city was saved uh, for, for that. Also, another point we have to, uh, um, we have to uh, highlight is the ability of each of us to effectively communicate with God. We know from uh, the 13 principles of faith set out in the Yigdal that we say uh, that Hashem analyzes and evaluates every one of our hidden, hidden thoughts or you know, not-so-hidden thoughts. So this is very important to understand that whoever we are, God, 100% of our lives, 100% of the time, uh, is, is analyzing and listening to every one of our thoughts. And this is very important to realize, and that even minor thoughts are noted by God. A third one I just think wanted to include is this parallel to the concept of Teshuvah. Uh, even though uh, this city of Sodom must have been many hundreds of thousands or However many, there were five cities that were going to be destroyed. Five cities, yeah. Um, but, but God... They were would, all destroyed, by the way. They were all destroyed. But, 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 but God would have saved for ten people. Yeah. So mm-hmm. when, we, when we look at ourselves as Saddam, perhaps, but we have that granule of goodness in us, God mm. would, would, uh, would save for that granule of goodness uh, and work on that, work mm. on you to, to increase that granule. So let's ta- let's bring forward these two. Uh, let's take examples from both of these stories and take the take note of Avraham's brashness and braveness in order to save humanity. And let's bring it to today. Now we are suffering another kind of decimation or, or destruction, perhaps in the future of our planet by our own hands. Now, you could say it's some, some, part of me thinks that. 
uh, it's difficult to convince the humanity to save something when they don't see the immediate effects. If, for example, you see a dam's about to burst its breaches, you would, you would say, look, plug a hole there, cement this area. But we don't see the effects because then they're arriving and they're not coming. We see little flickers of the flame uh, in these floods we saw this last summer uh, all over Europe and, all, and these flash fires in, in Greece and other countries in Australia. And last year in Israel, I think, or the year before, we had terrible fires in Israel. Um, so um, if it's an unseen enemy, so to speak, people can be saying, look, we, I don't see the problem. It's OK. It's a bit warmer occasionally. But that's, is that really going to be a disaster? But we have to um, accept that uh, the prevention is the, it's like Rambam said. Um, he said, uh, anticipate uh, charity by preventing poverty. This is ex it's exactly the same uh, vein. He's saying, um, in advance, make a preventative measure and don't have to deal with the problem when it arrives. So this is a hard. This is a more. This is a higher level uh, challenge because we're 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 approaching something that um, doesn't exist at the moment. Uh, that's on its way, but it requires greater belief that what we're doing is. Correct. So, now, what do we do? If we were put in the same position where uh, God says, I'm going to destroy the world. It seems like, like he told to Avram, I'm going to destroy Sodom. We've been warned by scientists who are perhaps working on behalf of Hashem to give us the message that this is the problem and you, you've got till... 2020 so and so and 2030 so and so before this is going to happen that's going they can they they have computer models that simulate exactly what's going to happen so we've now been warned it's like god warning Abraham, i'm going to do this so what do we do perhaps all we can do uh, is plead with god in our minds and pray to god for for to save the innocent as uh, Abraham did for the righteous of Sodom. So, a mental exercise, if you, if God's confronted you, all, all our listeners, mm -hmm. and would say, T I want you to, you've got a chance to convince me not to destroy the world, or not, or to stop global warming, who would you be an advocate for? You know, if I would be honest with myself, even though I have taken... You know, I, I take this very seriously, this whole climate issue. What do I really do? I have adjusted my diet. Uh, 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 I don't do any protests of embassies. I don't do any of this. I don't do that. And I consider myself someone who's an acti you know, active mm. uh, member of someone who wants to uh, perhaps uh, take climate change very seriously. So I'm not innocent. So with Saddam... Avraham was effective because he pleaded for the righteous and the innocent. Now, because Hashem is, uh, effects perfect justice, once uh, Avraham had said, you, must, you can't kill the innocent with the guilty, Hashem immediately conceded, I cannot kill the innocent with the guilty. I will save Saddam for 50 righteous people. And he went down to 10. So, Hashem, Hashem is now asking you, who do you, who will you plead for? Who would I, who do you think I should save humanity for? There is one uh, sect of population that is absolutely innocent. It is the the young children, the newborns that are being born every day. Uh, perhaps you have a child yourself, a toddler, an infant. They are completely innocent. All they do as you wheel them around in their pram is they can recognize you as their mother or their father they recognize their siblings but more than that they don't recognize maybe they recognize trees as they're being walked in the park but they are completely innocent of this impending disaster that will shape their lives and it will be an, a, a, a real major problem for them in their lives they don't know what they've been uh, kind of born into so if you're going to plead, have, have spare, you know, next time you're walking in the park or you're in shul, you see toddlers in their prams, just ask God, save the world, look after the world for these children. Um, this is actually, um, if you consider that these are 
dramatic times and almost messianic times where you could consider this the kind of uh, end of the world, so to speak, we can look at Yeshaya uh, 11.6, uh, the very famous passage that talks about what the world will be like during these messianic times. And I'm going to read it from there, and it's fascinating because it kind of mirrors this advocacy for the innocent. And I'll read, it says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard lie down with the kid, the calf, the beast of prey, and the fatling together, with a little boy to herd them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion, like the ox, shall eat straw. A babe or baby shall play over a viper's hole, and an infant pass his hand over an adder's den. In all of my sacred mount, nothing evil or vile shall be done, for the land shall be filled with the devotion and knowledge of Hashem as water covers the sea. So this is very important. This is a kind of, it's from, from Ishaya, so it was a prophecy, and it's about the end of times or, you know, this kind of a messianic period. And it doesn't mention, amazing thing, it doesn't mention this a heroic figure, the Messiah who will come. It's not some political figure. It's not some uh, 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 charismatic hero that will emerge in the world as some uh, great leader to save us. This is what all of us think. That's what I know that I was thinking. The Messiah will be like some charismatic individual. It talks about infants and babies who are passing their hand or playing over a snake's hole or snake's den. In other words, it, it talks about children of the world um, in a very vulnerable position, uh, in a very dangerous position, and they'll be protected by God. So what are these children doing? These children aren't affecting any, any salvation or redemption for the world, but perhaps what causes this redemption are our adults uh, meditation upon um, asking God pleading with God or entreating with God to save humanity for the sake of these toddlers and infants that have no blame whatsoever who are purely innocent in this whole drama of what's going on now um, and also they talk about uh, about this, uh, about a second flood, uh, somehow. This is very. This is the last verse of um, of that Ishaya eleven six, where it says, um, "Nothing in all of my sacred mount, nothing evil or vile shall be done. For the land shall be filled with the devotion of the Lord, as water covers the sea." Perhaps this will be a new wave of consciousness, of reality, a, a, a reality check by humanity and realizing that we are all responsible for each other, and it's our job to look out for each other, and we must also pray to God, and this prayer and, and treatment of God on behalf of the innocent will perhaps affect a change of, uh, in this whole climate uh, issue. I want to finish off with uh, something from Guide for the Perplexed. It's part 3, chapter 11, where Rambam... He talks about um, talks about the ignorant people's ignorance in terms of what's going on in the world and what dangers they they uh, they pose. And I quote: "All the great evils which men cause to each other because of certain intentions, desires, opinions, or religious principles are likewise due to non-existence or privations because they originate in ignorance, which is absence of wisdom." A blind man, for example, who has no guide, stumbles constantly because he cannot see and causes injury and harm to himself and others. In the same manner, various classes of men, each man in proportion to his ignorance, brings great evils upon themselves and upon other individual members of the species. If men possessed wisdom, which stands in the same relation to the form of man as the sight to the eye, they would not cause any injury to themselves or to others, for the knowledge of truth removes hatred and quarrels and prevents mutual injuries. This state 
of society is promised to us by the prophet, Rambam is referring to Yeshaya, in the words, and he quotes this very Yeshaya uh, section, and the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, etc., and the cow and the bear shall feed together, and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp. Uh, Rambam continues, the prophet also points out what will be the cause of this change, for he says that hatred, quarrel, and fighting will come to an end, because men will then have a true knowledge of God. And he finishes off this chapter with the uh, concluding section, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Note it. He finishes, he closes it. So this is again, he's stressing that it's because of ignorance. If we're not aware of the problem we've caused, and now we are aware of the problem we've caused, we have to deal with it. And he says this, and he, he, he also mentions this kind of flood of consciousness that will envelop the world. Please God, this will be the only flood across the world, a flood of human enlightenment and consciousness. And please God, uh, may God um, deliver us from any potential issues to us or our children or our children's children wow that is an absolute gospel message michael <laughs> that is a long time coming um i hope you all really really take note of this this is essential um the least we can do as michael mentioned is our fill up that we are all capable of rich poor religious not religious we can all turn our hearts with the knowledge that michael just um gave us we can ask Hashem for mercy. We can all be in Avraham Avinu. So, um, I thank you very, very much, Michael. For, and uh, let's hope, Bezat Hashem, we will see a Yeshua from this. And um, we'll usher in the era of Mashiach, Bezat Hashem. Thank you very much. And have a wonderful and blessed week. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.